Documenta, thank you for uh, joining me. Um, I hope you'll forgive some of these questions. Some of them can be a bit obtrusive, um, but my only objective is to you know, get to the facts, get to the truth behind things, and I hope you'll enjoy this interview as much as I will. And it's truly a pleasure to have you on, especially under these incredibly difficult circumstances that we're all going through throughout the world. Um, I will accept your invitation at some point to join you in Jordan, uh, for the morning news show, um, but for now, I hope the well your you know fan base and my viewers and you know followers on Instagram and my subscribers on YouTube will enjoy this small platform that we've put up um, under difficult circumstances to try and get to the truth behind a lot of the controversies that surround you. And um, thank you for joining me. Let's start off with a, an easy question to break things in. Out of your current collection, for someone that's completely new to Oud Oil, what would you recommend them to? Well, I've used the uh, fruit tree parable in the past, and so it's a, a bit simplistic, but you know, you have someone that is new to fruits, you know, let's say, and what would you recommend to them? Well, cherries or apples or pears or plums or figs or bananas or guava. I'd recommend a fruit platter with a little bit of everything and then they can become acquainted with the different varieties of fruit bearing trees and then see for themselves where their own gustatory aesthetic takes them. So in this case I would recommend the ultimate oud sampler which is a sampling of different species of oud trees and it gives you enough oil to wear for many many wearings in each vial and you have oils as varied as Tigerwood 1990 and you've got things as different and as out there as Port Archie which is a collage of the Indonesian archipelago all of the species that are found in islands as far off as uh, Sumbawa and Sumatra and Borneo and Papua and so forth New Guinea and uh, you've got legendary oils, three selections of those. You've got Oud Ahmed, which is uh, North Malaysian, incredible caliber Oud oil, something that uh, I would say, you know, hasn't been repeated in the last decade by anybody making Oud oil. Uh, in the sheer grade of agar wood that was used. And you've got oils like the legendary province of Malinao and Borneo, Borneo 50k, something that try how hard as you as you may, you know, as hard as you may, and you, you won't be able to distill it today. And you've got oils like Kinam Rouge, Vietnamese oil, Krasna in this case, cherry red, uh, Kinamic Vietnamese profile, quite fantastic, and one of the most uh, layered. It's almost layered like a baklava. I haven't seen anything as complex or multifaceted as Kinam Rouge in, in my day. So for the price of a bottle of Oud, you can buy many, many samples, in this case nine, I believe. And uh, you can have nine samples for the price of one bottle of Oud. And you can have a sampling of the different species, different locales. Uh, different ecosystems under which these trees are grown and then you can decide for yourself well is you know is uh, Agaloka your thing or are you more of a Malacansis kind of person or do you prefer Filaria, uh, Microcarpa and so forth so I would say go for the sampler the ultimate oud sampler not only is it a sampling of oud it is an education in what artisanal oud can be because these were distilled very, very meticulously with extreme attention to detail, and which is something that you can't really get uh, you know, very easily in our current market. So it's a selection of not only different species and different flavors, but of the very best that agar wood as an aromatic has to offer. So let's say you're looking at, for example, rose or jasmine. Not only do you get all the different species of rose, you know, from the Centifolia to the Damascena and so forth. But you get all the locales. You got your Bulgarian rose, your Turkish rose, your Moldovan rose, your Russian rose, your Austrian rose, Indonesian rose, Indian rose, all in one little kit. 
and you have an idea of what 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 kind of rose is my kind of rose or well, that's the best way to tell rather than you buy a vial of you know Bulgarian rose auto and then that's all you know about rose it's my understanding that you can be shot <laughs> for trying to source a uh, wild oud in the kingdom of Brunei if that's the case did you take a bullet for Brunei Kino? well that's quite the question and the way you word it is very sounds very uh, moving you know imagine someone in the jungle and then all the risk that they're taking upon themselves going out there risking not only their wealth that they have to bring it's jungle people don't generally have bank accounts and in addition to their lives being put on the line uh, by the sheer danger of the situation imagine you go out there in the middle of nowhere like a place like Koh Kong uh, one time I was in uh, in uh, North Borneo, Malaysian side of Borneo, in the state of Sarawak. And I had this, in the middle of the night, I was asleep. I, I had this, uh, I woke up and my entire left arm was completely paralyzed. I had these incredible pins and needles going, you know, all the way down to my fingertips from my shoulder. And I was certain that this was a heart attack. I was convinced. I said, "This, I'm, I'm having a heart attack, right? I don't know where to go. So I took to the street and there's not a soul. I couldn't even get out of the hotel that, that I was in. Uh, the guard was nowhere to be seen. They had locked the door. It's a totally, you know, sketchy kind of scenario. And by the time I figured out that he was sleeping in the cabin outside, and I was banging, I was saying, I, I need the doctor, I need, I need an ambulance, you know, I need someone. He just sh shrugged at me, he said, well, you know, where am I supposed to get you that? So I just ran out of the hotel into these empty streets. Imagine like being thrown back to like the, the 1960s or something like this, where there's no one, there's things have not been built yet around you. It's like everything is undeveloped, kind of like that and cars going by you know the one or two cars that went by i would be shouting at them like please stop i, I need you to take me to the hospital or a doctor and they would just keep driving and say this guy's crazy you know they wouldn't understand what i was what i was after so i guess that's as dramatic as i've lived and finally i did make it to a hospital in case you're wondering how that story ended I did make it to a hospital that was this, it looked like, if you can imagine, like a like a World War II hospital, like, that's been built just, just for the sake of, like, amputating limbs off of people and stuff like this. And I was waiting there, staring at the ceiling, when are these guys going to look at me? Nobody really cared of anything, and they had these uh, people dying of various things. I said, look, I need a different, I need a different kind of hospital. This is not going to cut it. The line is just too long. Uh, so I hired a, a car to take me to a private clinic. We went there, that was closed. Had an actual shutter, like a metal shutter that was shut down and locked. And then we drove to another so-called private clinic. And here the shutter was only halfway down. And we were able to crawl underneath it to get to the emergency area, which was just like this uh, desk. And they had someone on call there and they checked my pulse and everything. And they said, this is probably like a nerve thing, like a pinched nerve or something like this. And uh, they gave me this heart attack medication to have on hand just in case something happened in the future. They said, you just take this and keep it under your tongue. I said, okay, whatever. So that was that. Given the endangered nature of wild oud, is it still ethical to harvest, and why? Uh, it absolutely isn't. Uh, if a tree is hardy and it still has the ability to survive and fight any infection and continue to thrive, I think it is absolutely unethical to harvest that tree. And uh, most trees that are found in such a state in the wild are instantly uh, cut down if it is believed that it contains resin 
and uh, there's a reason that the rules are in place and it is to safeguard this species from extinction which is why we don't harvest wild agarwood uh, in the jungle now unless the trees are left to continue to thrive we just harvest the resonated portions from the trunk or the trees are moribund but as a general practice we simply have given up the jungles a long time ago and i don't endorse any harvesting unless it's a jungle that is relatively uh, you know full of agar with like a newly discovered jungle like the philippines for example uh, i wouldn't harvest wild what i would do is i would go and look for harvests that have been done in the past like historical harvests in people's collections which cost a lot more than harvest that you can do today in the wild if you can't find anything. And so I would buy materials that were harvested decades ago from seasoned collectors and colleagues that I have in the, in the industry. And I would distill that instead. So that's the short answer to that is, is, is this. What's the whole story behind this uh, crime and punishment war and peace fiasco? What's Ensar's side of the story?